I'm Carmen Ermo. And I'm Sarah Softness, Assistant Curator of Special Projects. We are your session hosts for session three. Um, in session three, we're covering a wide range of topics, so from spirituality to sexuality. Um, here we're hearing from business and philanthropic leaders, as well as from women who have galvanized millions. So it is my pleasure to introduce our first conversation. We're bringing together colleagues from the Open Society Foundations who have generously supported this conference, uh, Google and Cheddar Inc. So with that, please help me welcome Alvin Starks, Rashida Bumbre, William Floyd, and Anjali Kumar. Good afternoon. What an incredible day. Um, I'm super honored and thankful to Bonnie, Tom, and for this invitation. And I'm super honored to be here with my colleagues, Alvin Stark, Anjali Kumar, and William Floyd, to talk about this important role of philanthropy and also the private sector in driving social change through culture and art. Um, so I just sort of wanted to bring us into this conversation with the great um, understanding that I think we all have in this room today, and that is that this political moment necessitates us to be responding. It necessitates us to um, be able to think on our feet and to move aside the layers of uh, bureaucracy that exist in the various fields that we're working in um, to move us forward in terms of the political reality, but also the political and collective imagination. Um, so I wanted to really begin this conversation um, really with William, because I think the great legacy of lynching exhibition, which I'm sure many of you all experienced, is a really wonderful example of the way that museums who, you know, those of us that have worked in museums, we know that there can be sort of a um, dinosaur kind of time frame that we work under. You know, we were studying for this exhibition for five years and then, um, you know, we present it to a million people and finally when it's time to make the exhibition, you know, it's gone through all of these things. But what does it really mean to respond um, in your curatorial work, in your um, director work, and also um, in your role at Google um, to make the things happen that can respond to the political reality of the day? Um, so, William, I really wanted to begin with you and sort of talk about what it means to be responsive in your work and how have you um, been able to really foreground um, the importance of art in the conversation about not only our political reality but our historical memory um, and the necessity of actually um, telling the truth about history um, so that we can um, deal in reality, but then also begin to imagine the future that we want to live in. Well, thank, thank you for having me here. It's a, a great honor to be on this stage. I've sat out in the audience for many a year uh, for conversations up here, so I'm quite honored to be here with my colleagues as well. But as you created the context for the conversation about being politically responsive, Google's work with EJI and the exhibition, the beautiful exhibition, the haunting exhibition that was here um, most recently at the Brooklyn Museum, was actually born out of the, the company and specifically the employee's need and desire to respond to the horrific racially motivated killings that uh, started two years ago. So um, in the wake of the Charleston shootings and the shootings Michael Brown and Eric Garner, uh, Google employees led by the Black Employee Resource Group uh, held a series of awareness campaigns to show solidarity with the movement. And that spurred the company and particularly the foundation to figure out like how can we support our employees and most importantly, how can we support the community the communities that are being affected by this through philanthropy. So through our inclusion grants, um, we created a racial and social, social justice portfolio where we gave out, you know, at least at the time, a total of $5 million. That's now grown to uh, $20 million. Um, yes, incredibly impactful, but we, we kind of knew just intrinsically that we needed to do more, we wanted to do more. 
um, and particularly through our philanthropy, we wanted to know how, how can we really promote the change that, that we demand, that we all demand. And that led us to reaching out to Brian Stevenson, to initially to advise us, like, what should we be doing, knowing of the great work that he and the Equal Justice um, uh, Initiative does, we thought he is the best person to, to help us. And he was the one who uh, very smartly, you know, said, you know, kind of what you're doing is tactical. What you need, what you need to be doing is the strategic work to change the narrative around what's happening because what you're seeing is just a slice. What, what history shows you is that this is a part of a longer, you know, more horrific structural response to, to race in this country. And that culminated in a very moving speech that Brian gave to Google, and as I was saying to Anjali, who's also a former Googler, um, it was so <laughs> moving that our founders were like, okay, we need to write him a check right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and that embarked us on an incredibly, you know, moving partnership that uh, culminated not only in us just giving him money and supporting Brian's effort to create a memorial and a museum to uh, the legacy of lynching, but we, again, you know, feeling compelled to change that narrative, um, we thought, like, what can we do? So we thought, A, you know, we're a technology company. We're completely out of our depth, but we know technology. What can we do? So we thought, let's underwrite this with data. Let's get the information out there about how, you know, this legacy starts from, like, lynching to segregation to mass incarceration. Let's help Brian tell that story. But we knew data wasn't the only thing that we could do. Mm -hmm. um, for most world, most of the world, I think data is dry. And we thought, we, if we want to change the narrative, we need art, um, which then gave rise to us creating this exhibition with Brian, uh, which gave rise to a film, which is amazing, curricula. But again, we knew we needed to do more. And that's when we turned to Anne and Sarah, um, who I really have to bow down because once we launched this initiative, we realized like, oh, this really should have a home in art. There needs to be a dialogue with art so that this can be illuminated. Who can we talk to? Who can we do this with? And also, who can do this in like five weeks' time? Because <laughs> right. literally, that's, a, that's the Google way. Like, can we do this quickly? And you know, I raised this with you know, Jay Ford and David Berliner, who works here, and they ran back to Anne, and Anne was like, we have to do this. And that culminated in, in an amazing exhibition um, on the legacy of lynching that not only spotlights the work that we did with Brian, but put that in dialogue with art so that people could see artists forever have been talking about the racial injustice that unfortunately seems to be you know, a foundational element to our country. Thank you. You know, I think what was most amazing for me as someone you know, that comes from the art world and has been living with the work of Glenn Ligon you know, for, for many, many years uh, was how this, these works from the Brooklyn Museum collection could actually sing in a different way. Um, and could speak in a different way. And so even this work from Glenn Ligon that looks at, I always wondered what would happen to all of that beauty, this concept um, from James Baldwin, um, I think you know, was really sort of beautifully contrasted with the reality of this moment of these women walking with the jars, with the names of their loved ones, to collect the soil at the base of the tree where he, he was lynched. And I think that sort of um, walking in that reality reminds us that so many of us will never have an opportunity, right, to actually um, be in the place where these atrocities happen and acknowledge um, that these atrocities happen there. But we all live in that reality. We all live in that um, sort of, you know, 
collective imaginary space, but also political reality of racial trauma. And so I think the way that this show juxtaposed these very real stories, but with these um, metaphoric um, artworks, right, um, what really spoke to the power of the artworks, uh, but also spoke to this idea that Sadia Hartman said of, I live in the time of slavery because I live in the future created by it, right? So that, you know, we're living in the time of lynching right now. And I think that this exhibition really um, incredibly brought us all into that reality. And obviously the work that EJI will do moving forward um, with the memorialization of the spaces, right? We'll, we'll continue to do that. Um, thank you. I wanted to also, Anjali, speak to you just really about um, you know, the role that you've played. And it was amazing to me to realize that, you know, that you've been doing this even at the kitchen, sort of bringing people from, from various um, professions and ways of approaching ideas into the necessity of art, right? And so I would love to hear you just talk about not only your role at Google and Cheddar, but also your role as a board member for Amplified um, and the way that you sort of see the necessity of your, of your role um, in, in the private sector to drive these, these conversations. which may not be like this um, And to me, art is a compass. It's a moral compass, especially in these dark times where they, they can speak in ways that words can't, where um, it just provides that guidepost. And so I think it's, it's just something that, a symbol that we can all gather around for something like the amplifier work. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know what's happening to my, is it hum? My mic's off? Did I lose my mic? You can have mine. <laughs> mine's <laughs> off. You can just lean in and just keep going. I'll speak loud. Is this better? Is that Here they are. Here they are. Here they are. Hello. 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 Hello context and guideposts and all the rest of it. And I think it can act that way within institutions too, within companies. Um, and I think, you know, having been sort of born and raised within the Google uh, framework of having worked there for a long time, I think what they did was incredibly brave and I think they shouldn't be the only ones doing it. I think all mm -hmm. companies in this moment, they need to stand up, they need to be more vocal, they need to be, um, you know, providing that leadership and and taking a stand on things. And so to me, it's just not a, non, it's a non-negotiable. Like these are not political issues. They are not, um, they're not really issues up for debate. These are fact-based things. And so we can look at the data, as William said, and say, these things happened and these things are not okay. And these corporations are in an incredible position with um, incredible brand megaphones and you know, spaces in communities to be able to have some of these conversations and to push these things. And I just think, um, it's all, all of our responsibility. And so I'm not here speaking on behalf of Cheddar. I work for a news organization now, and you know, they need to maintain a, like some degree of, of neutrality, and I understand that, but I think as leaders within a corporate community, it's really important that we take a stand and are strong about it. And so I applaud what you guys have done in a major way. Thank you, and I think you know one of the other things that is really interesting, and I know it was great to hear the presentation about Amplified, is like how, because I think working with artists my whole life, all artists um, hope and imagine that their work would be accessible to the whole world, right? 
you know, obviously they think about a specific audience, but I think this idea of making artworks available, available to people for functional um, purpose is, you know, is really incredible. And I think it also is, talks about this idea of how do we respond to this moment? What are the needs? Um, and so, you know, I think thinking about the news, I mean, obviously, the, how did the news become a controversial sort of idea that, that it's, you know, <laughs> that it exists <laughs> to tell us the truth, right? I think that even that very premise is now in the dialogue and up for conversation. So I think it, it puts it on a plane with art, right? Where like the maker um, is bringing a truth, but that truth is meant to be um, interpreted and that truth, that we have to meet it there, right? We have to do the same work that the artist made. Um, so I think, you know, sort of bringing people the way that you do from different sectors to this conversation to understand their role is, is so important. Yeah, I think just the idea that they have a role and should not be reticent. And I think, you know, again, people might feel like they can't step into the fray because they have customers on both sides of the aisle or users on both sides of the aisle. And that's fine if they don't want to step into the deep fray, but there's plenty of issues out there that are, like you said, sort of up for debate, which just shouldn't be, that are fact-based. So step into those, right? So if Google can take on something like lynching and talk about mm -hmm. those racial injustices in such a powerful way, then I think the rest of us shouldn't be scared to talk about climate change. Like that feels like... Right. Right. Because right. right. look, don't get me wrong, we, we were scared waiting into this, to this entire discussion, but you know, one, once, once you once you're there, you you realize it, and you you mentioned it in terms of Yoshida, you know the idea of you know illuminating you know the thing that is obscured or you know highlighting the voice or the narrative or the history that's that has been you know shunned is actually kind of a part of our mission. We believe in information. We believe in data. We believe in supporting you know um, having platforms that support every, everyone's you know discussion point and when you saw this um, it was we just felt morally compelled thank you I want to move to my colleague Alvin who I had the great pleasure of working with at the Open Society Foundations and in his work and you know he can speak for himself but I first just want to say that everyone at Open Society Foundations is so glad that Alvin came back um, and so he had a sort of 10 year tenure out in the world where Open Society Foundation just, you know, held the string out for him. And now that you're back, I mean, you've been back for a year and the sort of way that you've galvanized people around racial justice is, is really incredible and around the, the necessity of culture in the conversation for racial justice. And so I would love for you to just speak a bit about your perspective and the way that you sort of see these things as braided together, as you, as you say. Perfect. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Are you guys out there? So it's not a surprise to me that um, before I came back to OSF, the Open Society Foundation, uh, I was actually at the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. Uh, so I must admit, I feel like that was just a prophetic doorway into coming back into philanthropy from like 135th to 57th. Um, and those worlds could not be further apart. Mm. Um, and what I wanted to do was to kind of bring those worlds together. Um, it was interesting hearing Anjali as well as um, William talk about, you know, these words of uh, illuminating and darkness. And I do think this is the role of artists. Um, and if anything, I believe that the artist is the soul of social justice movements. Uh, and it was great to really hear so many people bring reverence to uh, the great David Baldwin. Um, I feel like we can't have a conversation about arts and social justice without thinking about uh, Brother Bibby. Amen. Um, and just, just, just the sheer idea, which I think is really clear here, is that you know, art actually illuminates. That's the role of the artist to really take these dark, uncomfortable moments and to create another vision, uh, a radical vision, as someone said earlier uh, in the presentation. Um, and so I do believe that if one takes on, you know, I think in foundations, I, I kind of think of myself as a curator, that I'm pulling together various grants to sort of make a narrative story, mm -hmm. yes. right? And that these grants have to make sense. Um, and that I have a whole template of things to sort of work with, right? Money being just one part of it, but I think the part
partnership that you spoke of, really making these things uh, interconnected and making them very obvious. The other thing I just wanted to say that the idea of arts and social justice has always been with us. It's not new. You know, it's like, it might be new to you, but it's not <laughs> new, right? Um, and I think one of the earlier, if you were to kind of coin the phrase, um, Afrofuturistic artist was Aaron Douglas. You know, I think his work and actually creating an alternative vision during the Harlem Renaissance um, really laid the pathway for what became the civil rights movement, right? If you don't have a vision of your people, then you will always stay where you are, right? And I think Douglas's murals were very much a part of that, right? So they, they showed up, um, obviously, in magazines. They showed up in books. They were very much a live part of really creating the milieu, the kind of excitement for both uh, social justice demand, but also vision. And so art has always been braided together inside these movements. Like if you were to close your eyes, you know, these movements have songs, they have dances, right? They, they come with cultural um, creations that are necessary, right? It's not just the, the march, but it's all the other cultural elements that are a part of it. Um, the other, next slide. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, what's interesting is like, <laughs> we're currently in a moment right now thinking about culture, about who we are. You know, I think American identity is changing and shifting. Um, and in the past, we actually had very strong identities of what kind of culture we were wanted to be. So, you know, these Robert E. Lee statues are very much about putting them in public spaces. And they're really meant to celebrate someone and demean someone else. This question of who belongs, who's other, that's all raptured inside what art can do. Um, and they also bring them to the, to the fold that societies and civilizations have to change. You know, um, when you think about um, just when regimes happen, they necessarily have to shift the culture, right? They have to take down whatever ideas you have of gods, of culture, and they have to replace them with something else. Mm -hmm. um, so even when you look at this current administration, you know, it's attack upon the National Endowment is very clear, right? It's, it's as much a, an attack on Muslim ban as well as the artist mm -hmm. industries. And if you miss that, you're going to be in shock because those things are really interwoven. Um, also at OSF, you know, in rethinking ourselves, I actually do run a civil justice portfolio. It's a racial justice portfolio. So it's not in the classic um, art framework. I saw earlier my, my colleague, uh, Roberta Uno, she was at Ford. Uh, had an arts-based uh, project, and we worked together on some hip-hop activism work back in the... Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, we currently have a fellowship program uh, that actually does support uh, multidisciplinary works, and it's because of Rashida, we decided to also include artists and documentary makers, and so one of the artists that we supported was um, Hank Willis Thomas, who was also here earlier. And, uh, so, I should have brought that slide earlier. <laughs> so what's interesting about Hank's work is that obviously it's this Afro pick, right? Uh, that's actually right symmetrically across from a statue of Frank Rizzo, who was a mayor of Philadelphia, um, who actually um, was just, just decimated black communities and also launched an attack upon the Black Panthers as well. And so what you are seeing is a public conversation about race without words, yeah. right? It's yes. actually creating a space around who belongs, who doesn't, what does othering mean, what does America mean? And it's actually all these different ideals, right? Like the pick really is symbolic of not just the notion of being black, but actually belonging, right? So um, this conversation for us is really bringing together race and the arts so that they are much more realigned and really recognizing that we can actually do more. And the other thing, my final point is that I, I also recognize that people understand race through arts and culture. You know, that's what people actually learn most about Muslim communities, Native American communities. They learn it through the media. They learn it through culture. So if we do not pay attention to those spaces, um, that's going to be our mistake as America currently re-envisions itself. Thank you. And...
I think that, um, you know, just to sort of ground us, um, we, so my work at the Open Society Foundations works with all of the thematic and regional programs throughout um, 56 countries to encourage and support the inclusion of art and artists in human rights and social justice strategies. And I think it's a very radical model, experimental model, but I think we see that if we don't actually participate in the cultural narrative, we end up in this political moment. Um, and so I'm um, really grateful for all of the work that all of you are doing um, to, to help us actually envision the reality and create the reality that we may not live to see, but that we need to get to um, collectively. Thank you.